copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast four. Proceed at once to Central Police Station. The man in the chief's office threatening to blow up the building. That is all. Gordon. that law enforcement departments are better equipped to fight crime than crime is to fight them. The departments are furnished with every time-saving device and reinforced by modern science. Peace officers are trained by experts skilled in every phase of police investigation. And last but not least, the men who protect society are willing to give their lives in performance of their duty. In the story you're about to hear, a police officer made a decision that took the kind of courage for which our law enforcement agents are noted. Took a chance with the odds of 100 to 1 against him. Listen to the true story of the human bomb. We reach far back in the police records to bring you a story of one of the most daring and desperate plots ever attempted by one man. A dynamite terrorist held an entire city police force at bay and threatened to blow the city hall to bits as he calmly sat in the chief of police's office with his infernal machine on his lap. One morning, a strange apparition looking like a man from Mars appeared at the chief's office. His face was completely covered with a sheepskin hood which was pierced in two places by ghostly green goggles. Atop the hood, he wore a battered soldier's campaign hat. He carried a large box painted blood red. One hand he held inside the box. The other, supporting the box on the outside, was also painted blood red. The chief secretary, amazed at his appearance, accosted him as he pushed through the swinging gate into the office. Who, who did you wish to see? I want to see the highest officer of the city. Well, you're in the wrong place. Let me by. I'm going in there. You'll have to take your business. Let me by if you know what's good for what's you. Out there, Miss Jim? This man wants Let in, but he won't... Let me by. Let him in. I'll talk to him. Uh, I want to see the highest officer of the city. Are you him? Well, I'm uh, chief of police, if that's what you mean. Are you the boss around here? Well, in this building, yes. Where did you come from? A fancy dress ball? It don't make no difference where I come from. Well, uh, who are you? That is my business, too. Well, maybe you'll tell me why you're dressed up like this. Are you advertising something? No, I'm not advertising anything. I mean business. I came down here for a reason. And I got something here that's going to make you do as I say. Well, now, uh, that all depends. Depends? On what? Depends on what you've got there. Oh, it will do the business. And what do you want me to do? 
What's in the box? A machine that will blow this building and everyone in it to bits. What did you say? I said a machine that will blow this building and everyone in it to bits. Indeed? Yeah, indeed. You want a demonstration? Oh, no, no, thanks. Perhaps there's no need for it. Now, maybe you'll tell me what's on your mind. I want you to send for Paul Shoup, the president of the Pacific Electric Railroad, and make him come down here. I want to talk to him. Paul Shoup? Yeah, Paul Shoup. That's the man I mean. Get him down here. Now, whatever in the world do you want with Paul Shoup? That is my business. He's the whole shooting match down at the railroad company, and I want to talk to him. but he couldn't help you. He doesn't own the railroad. He's just the president. You heard me. I want you to get Paul Shoup down here. I got something to say to him. Remember, all I have to do to set this thing off is to jerk my hand out of the box. Yes, yes, that's all right. Now, um, we'll try to get in touch with him in just a second. Oh, Snively. Yes, sir? Get in touch with Paul Shoup, president of the Pacific Electric Railway, and ask him to come down here at once. Yes, sir. And show him in the moment he gets here. You're not going to call him, are you? Didn't you see the chief wink? I'm going to take the call. I'll go into my desk in the chief's office. You ring me from the switchboard, and I'll answer on a dead line. Get it? Yes. Oh, but I'm scared. Do as I say. All right. They're ringing him now, sir. Oh, that's good, good. Now, uh, look here. Did it ever occur to you that you'd blow yourself up as well as the building if you let that thing go? That is my business. I've thought it all out. I'm going to see that those railroad men get a swear deal or die time. Well, there's the call, Chief. Uh, I'll get it. Hello, uh, Pacific Electric? Uh, Mr. Shoup, please. Uh, Chief Sebastian calling. Oh, he's not there yet. Well, just as soon as he comes in... Uh, Ask him to come down to the chief of police's office. Yes, it's very important. Thanks. Goodbye. Well, when will he be here? Well, they uh, they said that they expected him any moment. Good. When that guy gets here, he'll listen to me. He'll give those poor railroad men the wages they should get, or else. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the scarecrow in the chief's office? Huh? He says he's going to blow up the place with that box. Oh, is that so? Oh, it's terrible. I- I'm so scared. Maybe he really will, Lieutenant. Well, just to be on the safe side, maybe you'd better get the other girls and get out of the building. Where are you going? I'm going in there and see if I can kid him out of it. Uh, good morning, Chief. Oh, yes, it's Sam. I want to speak to you about that Gonzalez case and... Uh... Oh, I'm sorry I didn't know you were busy. Well, for the love of... Oh, what's this? Keep your distance. What have you got there? A shoe-shining outfit? You won't think so about the time I pull the trigger inside this box. Oh, is that so? Uh, what is it? Uh, one of those infernal machines? Yeah. That's what it is. Oh, fine. I've always wanted to see one of those. Uh, you mind if I look? Wait a minute. I'll show you something. You see this? Mm-hmm. That's dynamite. Uh, there are 59 sticks like it in here. Enough to blow this whole... Building into a cloud of dust. Now, do you believe me? No, I think you're joking. Now, listen, we've got a jailer here named John Shand who knows all about that stuff. Now, let him have a look at your box. And if he says it's dynamite, we'll all believe it. Okay. Tell him to come ahead. But if he tries anything fun... Oh, he won't. I'll see if he's around. Oh, John. John Shand. Yeah. John. Uh, in the chief's office, will you? Come in. Shoop had better hurry. I'm getting tired of holding this trigger... And all I need to do is let her go. And now, don't get excited. Good morning, Chief. Did he call? Oh, yes, sir. Brown here calls. Uh, yes, sir. Well, this man here claims he's got dynamite in that box, and I doubt him, John. I want you to tell me if it's the real stuff. Uh, here, uh, let me have that sample. Here you are. You'll find out quick enough. Yeah. Well, well, John, what about it? It's a real thing, all right. Huh? It looks like about 80%. Yeah? Well, he says he's got 60 sticks there. Claims that's enough to blow us to bits. Is that right? Blow us to bits? I'll say it would. And scatter the bits over the county. Rumor spreads like wildfire through the downtown district. There's a maniac loose. He's going to blow up the police station. It's murder. Wholesale murder. There's a madman in the police station. Hurry up to the police station. 
Crowds of imprudent people bear down on the police station, mill round the entrance on First Street. Mounted police strive vainly to push them back to a safe distance. Get back there! Back up, get back, up. back there! Move back! You gotta get back there! Oh, yes, Harry! We'll have to get some more men and rope the street off! And in the jail on the third floor, the excitement of the crowd informs the 260 prisoners of their helpless plight as a sergeant rushes through the building warning the city employees to get out at once. Get out of the building, folks. What's the matter? There's a man in the chief's office with a bomb. Everybody out of the building. Hurry, girls, get out as fast as you can. What are we going to do with these men? You get them out, all right. Get some of the boys and help me herd them into the drunk tank. They've sent for the streetcar. It'll be waiting by the time we get them out the back way. Good. Okay. Pipe down. Pipe down. We can't get no place with all this noise. Now listen to me. I'm unbarring the doors. File out and barring the doors. File out and march down to the drunk tank. And don't try any funny business. All right, boys. Get along there. Make it snappy. Come on, boys. We have an all day. Now listen carefully, men. Down in the chief's office, there's a nut with a load of dynamite threatening to blow up the building. I'm serving 30 days for beating the old lady. I wasn't given no death sentence. All right, all right. Pipe down now and listen. The boys are stalling this bird along, trying to kid him out of it. Let them be heroes if they want to. You know, get me. Yeah, but we're caught like rats in the trap. Yeah, boys, boys. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If you'll all be quiet, we'll be out of here in five minutes. Oh. Now listen, we're taking you out the sideway and we're putting you into a streetcar. Now for the next few minutes, act like men, not cowards. Okay, Bob, get him into the handcuff chain. We'll get you out of here in no time, boys. All right, come on. Under the watchful eye of Jailer Shen, the 260 prisoners are emptied from the jail, loaded on the waiting streetcar, and transported to the east side station. In the chief's office, Sebastian and the terrorist face each other silently. The hooded man keeps his hand within the blood-red box, balefully watching the chief through his green goggles. In the outer offices, detectives discuss the situation in hushed tones. He could use an ammonia gun on him. Yeah, that ought to work. And he claims that the thing goes off when he releases his hand. If we use ammonia, then the relaxation of his hand would blow us up. How about clapping a chloroform sponge on his face? Oh, that's not good. Couldn't get behind him. He's sitting plumb against the wall. And remember, he's wearing that sheepskin mask. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello, Tom. Get the prisoners out okay? Yeah, they're all gone, thank heaven. Uh, Any change up here? No. We're trying to figure out how to get that box away from the guy. See here. I could draw a bead on him from where I'm standing with his coat of mine, and he'd be dead before he knew it. Yeah, and so would you probably. Mm, too late now, anyway. He just moved his chair. Say, I got an idea. Let's tell him that Paul Shoup will meet him at the corner of... Uh, First and Broadway. Yeah, and then when you get him down there in that mob of people, what then? Well, we can clear the streets first. Not without calling out the National Guard. Here, wait a minute. We could try it. Get him out of the building and then make a break to get out of the way and take a pot shot at him from a safe Well, distance. okay, we've got to try anything. All right, go ahead, Snively. Give him the message. Uh, beg pardon, Chief, uh, yes. but uh, Mr. Shoup just called and said he'd meet you on the corner of First and Broadway in five minutes. Very well. Shall we go down and meet him? <laughs> you think you're pretty smart, don't you? Don't you think I'm wise to dodge like that? Well, I am. And it won't go. Here I am, and here I stay until Soup shows up. And what's more, I'm getting tired of waiting. I've been here a half hour now. If he don't show up in 15 minutes, I'm going to jerk my hands off this box. Now, think that over. Oh, but that wouldn't accomplish your purpose. You said you wanted to talk to Shoup. Something about the railroad men's wages. Oh, that doesn't concern us. Now, if you let that thing go, you'd kill a lot of policemen and yourself as well. There wouldn't be any point to that. Well, I don't count. And I don't like policemen. Minute after minute ticks on as the grotesquely clad killer faces the chief of police in sheer defiance. Seated stiffly upright, the skin hood outlining his nose and mouth, he looks like some brooding god from an ancient Assyrian temple. Outside, held in check by policemen and jail trustees, the mob grows by the hundreds every minute. While the detectives ponder some sort of solution to the dilemma, a newspaper photographer, at risk of his life, poises his camera for a picture of the terrorist. What was that? Oh, a picture. That is all right. Put it in your paper as a lesson to the exploiters of the working men. And you'd better get that camera out of here fast, because I'm yanking my hand out of here in just three minutes. All right, now, wait a minute. Listen. Hadn't you better use some common sense about... Oh, be quiet. 
I'm ready to die even if you're not. Get Soup over here in the next three minutes. You hear that? He's going to set it off in three minutes. He will, too. We've got to do something. I can't figure a thing out. Are you game to go in there with me? I'm game to go in with you anywhere, anytime, Sam. You've been in tough, tough spots before. All right. You got a blackjack? Yeah. Now, we'll go in there and ask him about hey, the thing, and then... you whispering about? If you're ready to put that guy out, count me in on it. We don't need you, John. Sam and I can pull it okay. No use in anyone else risking his neck. Two of you together aren't big enough to keep me out. All right, here's the plan. You crown him, Jim, and I'll grab the box and run to the street. I'll grab the no, box. No, 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 I will fit. Now, listen, Jim, you've got a wife to think about. Now cut the argument. I'm grabbing the box. If we don't get in there in a minute, he's going to let that thing go. Okay, let's go. All set, Jim? Set. Uh, Mr. Shoup will be here any minute now, but uh, whether you come to an agreement with him or not, I, I wish you'd give us fellows time to get out of here before you set that thing off. When Shoup gets here, I don't care what you birds do. Pretty neat little contraption you got there. Must have taken you quite a while to rig that up. Uh, what's this thing for? What thing? This gadget down here. Uh, Grab it, Jim! I got it! Come on, come on, come on. Terrorist slumps forward, both Fitzgerald and Brown grab at the box. Brown yanks it from Fitzgerald and runs down the stairway. Seeing a fuse sizzling within the infernal machine, he plunges his hand through the glass top of the box, extinguishing the flame. Down the stairs he leaps and out the front door of the police station. A cameraman has set up his tripod in front of the entrance. Hurtling out of the door in his headlong flight, Brown stumbles over the tripod. He has the presence of mind to throw the bomb from him. Sticks of dynamite spill from it as it careens down First Street, scattering the frightened crowd. Jumping to his feet, Brown runs to the smashed box and holding it high over his head, Smashes it again and again on the cobblestone. All right. All right, all right. All right. Well, well, it's all over. Oh, great work, Sam. All right, here. Oh, hey, Brown, you're bleeding. Huh? Oh, that's funny. I didn't notice it before. I must have cut myself when I jammed my hand in there to put that fuse out. You mean you actually stuck your hand in the thing and put it out? Oh, sure. It was the only thing to do, wasn't it? Certain that no damage could come from the infernal machine, the broken parts are collected from the street and carefully pieced together by police experts attempting to discover how the apparatus was to work. The machinery centers round a gun hammer mounted on a base. Under the hammer is a shotgun shell. Evidently, when the terrorist released the hammer, it would explode the shell. This explosion would ignite a slow-burning fuse leading to the 60 sticks of dynamite. One stick of this dynamite tested in Elysian Park blew a rock the size of an automobile into tiny bits. hours later, Brown and Fitzgerald visit the human bomb in the receiving hospital. Well, how is he, Doctor? He'll pull through, I think. He's semi-conscious now. For a while there, I was afraid we'd lose him. Now, don't lose him, Doc. We want to talk to him. Well, you can go in now. Uh, oh, my head. Oh, I... Uh... Hello, my friend. How do you feel now? Well, uh... Am I? You're in the hospital. Yeah. I'm mighty lucky you're not in the morgue. Uh, where's my machine? It's been taken all apart. And it did blow us to bits like you promised it would. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Now, you guys sneaked up on me and slugged me. But I can't understand why it didn't work. I must have made the fuse too long or something. It should have gone off. Well, it didn't. Thanks to the bravery of Sam here. Oh, come on, John. Come on, John. Cut it. Now, look here. We want to find out something about you. Well, by our head. What's your name? Carl White. Mm -hmm. Age? Uh, 35. Where do you live? Off on Lake Street. Now, tell us, what was the big idea of that show you put on today? Well, I thought the railroad men ought to have a little more money. That's why I told you to send for Paul Shoup. I thought I could scare him into promising to raise their wages. Besides, lots of men are out of work now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you got a job? Yeah. I do a little carpentry work now and then. I worked for the railroad company once. Uh, that's when I got the idea that they didn't get enough pay. Oh, you thought you'd do something about it, eh? Well, I tried. Uh, what do you think we should do with you? Don't you realize what a terrible thing you were going to do? No. I don't think I committed any crime. I kept telling you men to keep away from me. If the machine had gone off as I expected... Well, it was their fault. 
You committed a bigger crime than I did. Well, I don't follow your reasoning. But let's hear how that machine was to operate. Well, it was fixed with shotgun caps, with powder connecting up to dynamite caps. I had a fuse in there, and while I was arranging things inside the box to get it connected properly, I made a mistake and put the cap in the wrong place. Yeah? Yeah. So in order to hold the powder, I used a little dynamite to fill up the hole. I guess that's why it didn't burn fast enough. You guys didn't give it time to burn through. No, no, we didn't. Be quiet. You see, this machine was different from most. Instead of having to pull the trigger to make it go off, I had to hold on tight to keep it from going off. You see, I can't understand what happened when you hit me over the head. I thought sure the minute my fingers let go of that trigger, the thing would explode. And it should have. Because it was a beautiful machine. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't show your admiration for the thing. But I would like to know, what was the idea of the two red wooden fingers we found on the street near the box? Oh, them. Ah, uh, well, you see, I got two fingers missing on the right hand, and I knew if you ever looked in the box and saw them, you could identify me. Why? Have you ever been arrested before? Yeah, once. You got me in the rogues gallery. Now, uh, look here. Why did you go to the police station after Mr. Shoup? You knew you wouldn't find him there. Because I was afraid if I went to the railroad office, the bomb might cause a panic, and some of those poor workers might get hurt. But you didn't worry about killing a bunch of policemen. Huh. Well, that wouldn't have mattered so much. Well, I don't know about that. Well, why have you got it in for policemen? Oh, nothing in particular. Only they're always going around arresting somebody. And anyway, I didn't think you'd be foolish enough to monkey with the box. I was just getting ready to yank my hand out when you started asking fool questions. I don't know why I didn't see that blackjack in time. I don't... Uh, what other part of your scheme didn't work? Well, the railroad man didn't show up. Well, what if he had shown up and refused to do what you asked? We found a pair of handcuffs on me, didn't you? Yes. Well, I intended to handcuff Mr. Shoup to me. Then I was going to make him walk out of the station with me. Like he was an officer, and I was a crazy man. I was going to make him keep walking until we got out into the open country somewhere. Then I'd have kept him right there until he did what I said. And if he'd still refused, you were going to set off the dynamite. Uh, he'd have promised all right. And I'd have given him six weeks to make good. What do you mean? Well, if he hadn't given the men a raise in six weeks, I'd have come back down to the police station again. But I wouldn't have waited. I'd have blown it up as soon as I walked into the place. I intended to see that a working man got a square deal. You didn't choose a very effective way to see it done. Oh, I guess it was as good as any. Don't you think it was pretty brave of Sam here to grab that box from you? No. I don't see where it deserves any credit. You had no right to hit me. I was only trying to get a raise for the railroad man. Uh, have you ever been confined to an insane asylum? An insane asylum? Yes. An insane asylum. <laughs> you don't think I'm crazy, do you? Why, I'm perfectly sane. I'm all right. It's you people that can't see the injustice and suffering in the world. It's you people that are crazy. <laughs> Just a moment, you will hear the summation of our story.
test of insanity in a criminal case is whether or not the accused is conscious of the difference between right and wrong. If he is conscious of this distinction, then he is not legally insane. This test was applied to Carl Weiss. And he reacted to it just like an average intelligent person. Therefore, from a legal standpoint, Carl Weiss was sane, though he did suffer from the martyr complex. But this did not becloud his mind as far as knowing right from wrong. He was perfectly aware of the distinction. Carl Weiss was then duly tried on the charge of illegally transporting and depositing explosives in a public place. In this case, a police station. The jury found him guilty, and the court sentenced him to prison for 20 years. No, crime does not pay. Calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast for suspect now in custody. That is all. Gordon.